Thank you so much. For the first thing I've got to tell you is that I am not good at this. So, uh, you know, <laughs> have fun. Enjoy it at my expense. Case in point. <laughs> that was awesome. Okay. Uh, all right. So thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Nervous to be here, but and actually not as nervous as I thought I was going to be. It's going to be all right. <clears throat> I am uh, very happy to uh, be giving this talk tonight because uh, it's funny that um, the dean mentioned this. I was in the audience in uh, 2004, I think it was, when uh, Jim Hoagland was giving the talk for the Buckeye family's lecture, uh, and I remember coming away from it incredibly inspired. So before I say anything else, I want to thank the Buckeye family um, for this incredible lecture series, for keeping it going. I'm sorry that I am now here <laughs> as, as a part of it, but, but it'll be fine. I think, I think it'll, it'll be okay. Um, I also want to take a second to recognize Dean Bierbauer, uh, who literally uh, brought the school into the light, right? <laughs> During his time here. What, what a great run you have had. The school has been completely transformed since the last time I was here. And uh, we have you to thank for that. So as we say in Florida, please clap. Yeah. Okay, how was I going to do this? What is happening? No, it's controlling both at once. All right. This is incredible. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so anyway, I grew up in Somerville, South Carolina. Uh, and I went to school here at USC. But as a journalist, um, I know that I also came from somewhere else. If I wanted to be sentimental about it, I would call it tradition. One of, one of my first and best bosses was a hard drinker and an inveterate smoker who would stir his coffee in the morning with the first ballpoint pen that came to hand. I don't even know what's going on back there. He ran a bureau of the Palm Beach Post by the railroad tracks in Delray Beach in an office complex that also housed a dog groomer. And every time the commuter trains went by, the desks would rattle and the dogs would start barking. <laughs> I don't even know how this is working now. He was from Chicago, and he had gotten his start in the City News Bureau, which was the place that coined the saying, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. <laughs> As a kid, he rubbed elbows with Wally Spurko, who broke the story of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and who claimed to have carried a 38 on the Dillinger Raid. He also worked in close proximity with the legendary columnist Mike Royko. I have a direct line to that past. But now, there are groups of people, to be polite, we'll call them bitter assholes, <laughs> who keep contending that bloodlines like mine are definitively ending. I am so sick of hearing that. I want to tell you a story. It's about a young man who got out of college, ready to take on the world. He had a serious problem with authority and a huge amount to learn. He was lucky when he got a job at a small floor of newspaper. Still, nobody expected much out of him. But this guy was stubborn, and he was just smart enough to know that he couldn't let himself get comfortable that he had to keep pushing himself, had to keep doing stories he was deathly afraid of. He got a job at a bigger paper, and then at an even bigger paper. And then one day, years after he started, that reporter who nobody ever expected anything out of won a Pulitzer Prize. You know who that guy was, folks? Take another one. <laughs> that guy was Anthony Cormier. He sits next to me in the newsroom at the Tampa Bay Times. 
I stole that joke from Caddyshack, by the way, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sorry. The point is, though, that there are a lot of us out there. That is true about him, by the way. Anthony Cormier, all that stuff is true. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winner in 2016 for investigative reporting. Mm -hmm. And he does sit next to me. The point is, though, is that there are a lot of us out there, uh, more than people might expect. In Ohio, a reporter for the Dayton Daily News revealed that more than 130 sex offenders are living in nursing homes across the state and that the operators of the homes should have, who, who should have been protecting the vulnerable residents were not informing them of the dangers. In Arkansas, a reporter for KARK found that nursing home staffers got signatures from unwitting residents to get a controversial proposal on the ballot, one that would limit, attorneys da or one that would limit damages and attorney's fees in medical malpractice cases. I'm going to have a Marco Rubio moment here. <laughs> in Charlotte, a reporter for The Observer got a mentally ill prisoner who had been unjustly held for 13 years in solitary out of confinement. In Indiana, a reporter for WRTV showed that school systems were misreporting how often they put kids into seclusion and restraints. In Iowa, a reporter for the Des Moines Register nailed the State Department of Safety for using a creative interpretation of a law to keep secret records that would reveal police misconduct or shoddy investigations. All of those stories came out in the last 38 days. None of us who do this work would kid you that things are, are better now than they've ever been. Things are terrible in the industry right now. But for God's sake, that's exactly why we should spend a little time, every once in a while, reflecting on what's going right. It's why the people who are doing this work deserve better than to be written off by bitter assholes who aren't fully in, uh, in the know about what's going on. There's this incredible David and Goliath story going on across the country right now, where the giants are not only the big companies and the corrupt governments, but also this crushing negativity about the current state of things. And the people who are doing the work, my friends in newsrooms across America, are the ones holding the slings. Believe it or not, there is a lot about what they are getting done that should give you a great deal of hope. I can't believe this is working. <laughs> when I first started working in the bureau by the railroad tracks, this huge story broke. This is back in Delray Beach, Florida, around 2006. Police arrested two Catholic priests for stealing millions of dollars in collection plate money and using it to pay for girlfriends, limo rides, fancy dinners, and gambling trips to places like Singapore. They even ran investment companies and uh, bought property. After the first stories were done, my boss, who came up in Chicago, pushed me to do something important, something that I had never done before. He had me find out how many of the other priests in the Diocese of Palm Beach were living it up like that. He had me make a list of all the priests from the diocesan directory and see what I could learn. Basically, he had me define a universe for my reporting, and then he pushed me to learn absolutely everything I could about that universe. So I was 22, uh, and my boss was a good deal older than me, which meant I rolled my eyes a lot, and I wanted to give him the finger. <laughs> but when he started talking about things like this, I always hung on every word. Ultimately, we found that a couple of priests who were somehow racking up high-end real estate different priests, not the ones who had been arrested. They also had convinced the bishop that they should move out of their humble rectory behind Home Depot and pay thousands per month to rent a house in the ritzy PGA village, a house that was owned by one of the priest's sisters. Meanwhile, she lived in another house down the street, which was recently purchased by one of the priests. After that story ran, by the way, 
some unhinged parishioner sent me a Christmas card at work. It had a penguin on the front of it, and it said, look at the snow, look at the ice, look inside for something real nice. And it was filled with white powder. They had to evacuate our entire newspaper building for an hour, and uh, I got grilled for another two hours by the FBI. Anyway, seven years later, I was working on the investigations team at the Tampa Bay Times when Will Hobson, the night cops reporter in our Tampa bureau, got a hell of a scoop. He found out that the chairman of the county port authority was operating slum housing and that he was collecting public money to house the homeless in squalor. They brought me onto the story. And guess what my excellent boss, Chris Davis, pushed me to do? He had this he had us get this list of all the landlords who got paid tax dollars to house the homeless. We took the top 20 money earners and resolved to look at each of them as hard as we could. Just like we did when I was out by the railroad tracks, we defined a universe and then we set out to learn everything we could. We pulled police reports, code enforcement records, health inspections, regulator reports, lawsuits, We found that the county had paid millions of dollars to house homeless people, including veterans, the mentally ill, and families with small children in filthy, crime-ridden places across Tampa. We found that the county was continuing to send really sick homeless people to an assisted living facility that had lost its license, and that some of them were dying there. We found that the county was clawing back money from desperate families when the family finally started getting social security checks and calling it repayment for the money that they had spent to house them in subhuman conditions. In response, the county closed the program and pledged to do a better job taking care of the homeless in a city that had one of the worst homelessness problems in the nation. I should note here that a lot of what the bitter assholes say is actually true. We journalists have been devastated by a loss of institutional knowledge. We are now having to relearn a lot of the things that the old timers already had learned the hard way. It's not easy. But there are plenty of people out there who, like me, have been trained by reporters and editors who aren't around anymore. I spent 10 years taking their lessons to heart. And every single time one of them retired, or took a buyout, or got laid off, or made a horrific career decision to move to Gannett, <laughs> an important part of them kept going on in the work that I was doing. Incidentally, there's a kid on my team now. He just turned 24. He's got a high top fade, and he wears the tightest pants that I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> which I do not get at all. He rolls his eyes a lot when I talk. And I can tell he usually wants to give me the finger. I can also tell that when I'm talking about the stuff that's really important, he's hanging on every word. That's a big responsibility for me because I don't exactly have a great pedigree. I was a sophomore in college here at USC in an apartment on Divine Street that I was about to get evicted from when I knew for sure I wanted to be a reporter. I was thumbing through a copy of the best American newspaper writing 2002 when I came across a story about a grocery store written by Ann Hull of the Washington Post. This is real. I became a journalist because of a story about a grocery store. It's, it's not possible for me to enumerate all of the things about this piece of journalism which told the story of gentrification through the eyes of people being displaced that thrilled and terrified and inspired me. Ann Hull immediately became my hero and a symbol of what is possible in the field if you try. By the way, I've been in the same room with her now at least three times and uh, at events for like journalism big shots and I've never had the courage to say any of this to her. <laughs> it didn't take me long to realize when I was still in school that there was a big space separating my journalism 
for manholes. Luckily, I greatly distinguish myself here at USC. <laughs> for example, I am certain that I was the first editor of the Gamecock ever to put the news of his getting arrested for accidentally breaking a window while drunk <laughs> and celebrating a sport event on the front page. It was a misdemeanor, by the way, and, and the charge got dropped. I found just as much success as I searched for internships. These are some of the rejection letters I got <laughs> while applying to papers my junior year. They're just some. I have more. I finally did get one, though. Uh, at the Cape Cod Times in Massachusetts. In July 2004, I was in Brewster, sleeping in the spider-infested spare room of a woman named Tiger with a Y, <laughs> when I first read a story about Catherine Boo, a story by Catherine Boo, excuse me. It was a searing investigation of, uh, of the DC system for caring for adults with disabilities. And the writing was like the literature that I was supposed to be studying to get my degree. And more than that, the content was urgent, immediate, incredibly important, and as good as a cattle prod at getting the people in power to give a damn about a population that deserved a lot better. Right then, I knew that I had to try investigative reporting. Catherine Boo went right up there in my mind with Ann Hall. They were the two people whose examples I most wanted to live up to. I knew I was well on my way to living up to them in the final months before I was going to graduate from the University of South Carolina. I had gone out and interviewed and gotten a job at the Sarasota Herald Tribune, a paper in Florida, the state where Ann Hull herself had grown up and started her career, and I couldn't have been more ready to get started. A day or two before I graduated, in December 2005, I was at the USC Police Department picking up some reports for the Gamecock when I got a call from the Sarasota paper. The editor on the line told me that she was really sorry, but they were rescinding my offer. She said my driving record was too bad <laughs> to allow me to work at the company. So yeah. I packed up my books and some clothes and this lamp I really liked. <laughs> and I got into my beat up sedan and left for Florida that Christmas Eve. I was following my then girlfriend, who had also graduated from USC and who had a great driving record <laughs> and a better resume and who had gotten a good job at the Palm Beach Post. We had a little apartment in Stewart, Florida and very little money. And I remember having to drive to a distant job interview one day soon after that and realizing I didn't have enough money to pay for both gas and food. So I got a Quiznos sub at 11 o'clock that morning, ate half of it, and then ate the other half while I was driving home at 11 that night. I didn't get the job. I got a chance to make some money as a stringer for the Associated Press covering the Dodgers and the Mets in the Grapefruit League during spring training. Before he gave me the job, the editor asked me if I knew anything about baseball. And I lied and I told him I know everything about baseball. <laughs> Not long after that, one of the most prominent sports writers at the Associated Press called me on my cell phone from New York and gave me a severe talking to for not paying enough attention to Pedro Martinez. I remember that he really strongly implied that I was not going to make it in this business. <laughs> Incidentally, I did not see him at the last Pulitzers. <laughs> or the Pulitzers before that. <laughs> I ended up at the Palm Beach Post. I started as the paper's number two night cops reporter in the South County Bureau. I had a great time. The pre-story happened in my first couple weeks on the job. I was, I was covering sensational crimes, plane crashes, 
murders, elaborate fraud schemes. I was learning from the older reporters around me, and most of all, I was learning from my boss. That was in 2007. In 2008, the Post bought out, or laid off, about half of all the journalists who worked there, including my boss and all my friends. It's so sad, I know. <laughs> my girlfriend had already moved back to South Carolina, and she dumped me right after that. <laughs> I got demoted from night cops to the Sunday shift. Then I got put on firing notice for failure to write community news from the correct region, which was something that we regular reporters now had to do because our community news staff had been disbanded. So I wrote the damn community news. I did my job. And whenever I could, I picked out an ambitious story. I defined a universe to report on. And then I gathered up everything I could find about it. After about two years on the Sunday shift, the bosses started to notice. They took me off. They let me work from Monday to Friday. About two years after that, they put me on, in, on the investigations team. I was riding high. I even had a new girlfriend, a fellow reporter, and she was pregnant, which was like, whoa, but still good. <laughs> and, and then she got offered her dream job across the state at the Tampa Bay Times. We decided she should take it. I talked my bosses at the Post into a trial period of letting me work remotely. It was really scary. I didn't know what in the hell we were going to do. Then I learned that the Times had a new investigations team run by this incredibly handsome man, Chris Davis, who was then, and is now even more so, uh, an actual legend. He was looking to make a hire. If you're wondering, this is Chris giving a speech when we won the Pulitzer in this year. And he's in the cubicle of another USC alum, Ron Brackett, who is one of our deputy managing editors. So we, there's a lot of us up in Tampa Bay Times. So Chris was looking to make a hire. I knew that. My girlfriend and I were at the Hotel Indigo in St. Petersburg in April 2012 on a visit to find a place to rent So when she started her new job. And I asked her to marry me. Then I got in the car and drove 45 minutes south to Bradenton, where Chris had agreed to meet me at a place called the Lost Kangaroo Pub. <laughs> she said yes, by the way. We got married. <laughs> at the Lost Kangaroo Pub, I gave him the hard sell. And he did not want to hire me. But I kept at it, and eventually I wore him down. Less than a year uh, after I started at the Times, they let me onto this story about homelessness in Tampa, and that pretty much got me where I am today. Jesus. That is the most I have ever talked about myself in public, and it felt good. Now, now I know why people are doing it so much now. <laughs> but yeah, so there. Uh, you know, if I've been good at anything over the years, it's been at not focusing on the problems when there's still some good to be pried out of a situation. Maybe that's why I'm standing here now telling you hopeful things at a time like this. Because no, things are not great right now. There were more than 1,400 daily newspapers in America in 2004. By 2014, there were 1,300. Newspapers can't stop shedding good people. They just saw the sharpest workforce decline since 2009. From 1994 to 2014, newspapers lost more than 20,000 jobs. At last count, there were only about 33,000 people working in newsrooms nationwide. Still, there are good things to focus on amid all the bad. It has never been easier for talented young people to move up quickly in this business, and that is absolutely true, and I'm an example of that, even at big papers. And though there are fewer of us working in newsrooms than ever before, 
there is more access to vast amounts of collected wisdom and institutional knowledge than there ever has been. I'm thinking of groups like this, uh, the Investigative Reporters and Editors Incorporated, which is an incredible resource and which all of you should join or support. When it had its national conference out in New Orleans this year, there were 1,800 people who attended, which was more than ever before. The ballroom was just completely packed. At the very, very end of that photo, there's a stage where they were giving out awards. You can't even see it. There also are still scores of people like me in newsrooms across the country. People who have a little knowledge and who are getting a little more every day and who are ready and eager to share it with the next generation. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know that it will. I'm going to turn into a bitter asshole. <laughs> I'll be convinced that the whole industry is going to hell, that the craft I practice with such care and passion has completely ceased to be, that good investigative reporting is dead. I also know that when that day comes, there's going to be a former 24-year-old out there who used to wear extremely tight pants. <laughs> Or so I hope, because that is not healthy in the long term, <laughs> especially if he wants to have kids. That former 24-year-old will listen politely to me, and then he's going to shrug. Then he'll turn and face a younger group. If some of you out there are lucky, maybe you'll even be among them. It'll be a group that is ready to roll their eyes and give the finger. But one that also will hang on every important word. A group that'll know that it's a lie, that all good journalism is dead, even when I'm the one saying it. He'll turn to that group and he'll start talking. Thanks. I guess we can do questions now. Is that how this works? <laughs> All right. Ask away. That's great. See you guys later. <laughs> sure. You know, this is going to date me, but you know, I grew up with Walter Cronkite as someone that everyone trusted and loved. And now we look at this election process and what the media has done to interject themselves on both sides, <coughs> one way or the other. And where does that fit with investigative journalism that is trying to just be impartial mm -hmm. and give facts? So, I, yeah, you know, I think there are two sides to that question. One side is, has Walter Cronkite changed, or has our view of Walter Cronkite's changed? And then the other side is, um, there are a lot of people out there who are just personalities who are trading on that. Um, and I wish that I could give you a, a more nuanced answer, but like honestly, my, my sort of specialty has been in picking out something that is super wrong with the world and then going after it and documenting it in an, in an undeniable way. Um, so I, I feel like any type of political commentary that I gave you would just be the worst. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> political reporting commentary, but what do you... Mm -hmm. So uh, one, one antidote for that would be to read newspapers, I guess, unless you've got specific newspaper examples yeah. that, that, that you can bring up. But uh, yeah, I mean, that thing with CNN was crazy. But also CNN is employing, no offense, Dean, uh, the, 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 the former campaign manager of Donald Trump. So I mean, the whole thing is crazy. Um, I, I completely agree with you. So don't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, yeah, you know, it's, the funny thing that I learned uh, the longer and longer I've been a reporter is that you've got to be someplace to know what's going on in it. Um, so I can talk about Florida. Uh, I'm not sure that I could, I could stretch it into South Carolina. 
I've loved the work that the Charleston and Post and Courier has been doing lately. Um, the, the stuff that um, Doug Pardue and his team have been putting out uh, has just been phenomenal. Um, down in Florida, I think there, are, there is huge opportunity. We just did, this doesn't fall into the unreported category as of about six hours ago, but we just did a story about Allegiant Air. Maybe some of you guys have flown on it here. Um, they have the worst safety, uh, back up. They have the worst mechanical breakdown record of any uh, major U.S. airline. They're four times as likely to fail in midair as any other airline operating right now. Um, so, I, you know, I, I love stories like that, surprising stories where people think they know something and, and it flips around, but that's the best answer I can give at the moment. I'm sorry. Have you ever been afraid when you do the investigative reporting? Um, there have been times, uh, so at one time, and there have been, yeah, I mean, there have been times when I've been, when I've taken precautions um, during uh, w the course of doing my job. There was a time in w West Palm Beach when I worked at the Palm Beach Post that I wrote about um, some sex traffickers who were operating nightclubs, and uh, we were about to prove pretty definitively that this guy who was a felon um, was actually the owner of a nightclub that he had created this elaborate um, ruse to conceal because it's illegal to hold an alcohol license in Florida if you have a felony conviction. And I asked one of my uh, sources on the sheriff's office gang unit, you know, tell me honestly, how risky is this going to be? And he said, you have to put your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I got to put my name on it. So anyway, I got a gun. It was fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of looking at that question about underreported stories, do you feel like there are stories that you have to pass up sometimes simply because there isn't the, you don't have the staff to investigate it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that that's the case with probably every investigative team in the country. Ever since I took over Chris's job, um, I was just amazed um, at, at the volume of, of tips that come in every day to our newsroom. And so, yeah, there's some good stuff right now that is sort of um, in a holding pattern that, that I don't even want to tell my reporters about because I don't want to distract them from, <laughs> from getting the job done that we've set out for them at the moment. But yeah, I, there absolutely is stuff that, that needs to be attended to. Um, and we probably need more I-teams out there. I don't know if mine needs to get bigger, but there need to be more investigative reporters, for sure. Ultimately, bottom line, do you think you're doing any good? I don't know. There's, there's uh, senior care facilities that are going in the headlines tomorrow. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I agree. Stuff? That's a great question. I appreciate that. No, really, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so, like on a, any type of macro scale. Um, but it's just like, you know, I. I think that probably I have gone through this world up to this point making a very small difference in a very small amount of people's lives. And, you know, that's good. It's better than, like, pumping gas or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so, I, I mean, but no, I don't think I've, I've, I haven't taken down a president yet or anything like that. But. You might have shot that. All right. I appreciate it. <laughs> <that. Okay. laughs> some examples of good investigative journalism that probably a lot of us haven't heard of. Is, is that part of the problem is that the, the good stuff that's out there doesn't get attention beyond the local community where it is? And is there a way to have it, you know, more widespread? That this stuff yeah, is yeah. On? I mean, there, so there are places that you can go to, to, to see this stuff if you wanted to, but most people don't, they don't look for it. Um, most of the people who nod their heads when, when people tell them investigative reporting is dying don't go out and, and, and try to find investigative reporting because why the hell would you do it? If somebody got this great scoop in Akron and you live in West Palm Beach, Florida, you know, who cares? It's fine. But it's still out there. I mean, that's, that's my point. Um, I don't know if there, if, 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 so the question is sort of uh, a promotion question, I guess. And, and, 
And I think that like for the, these individual news organizations who are doing it, uh, yeah, it's a great idea to sort of constantly remind their, re their readers and viewers that this is the stuff that they, that they are putting out in the world. And it's real and it's not, you know, dead. It's right here and it's every week uh, or two. And I think, that, I think people, though, have been tuning into that a little more, especially with all the pressures on the industry. There's, I've seen a lot more good and bad self-promotion out of, out of organizations. Yeah, so I, right, the, right. So I think I think it's great uh, to to a point. Um, there, uh, the the best example that immediately springs to mind is the Ford Foundation, which has endowed some reporting positions at places like the Washington Post, for example. Um, and t typically, uh, those arrangements um, are are a grantor sort of grantee situation, and there are no strings attached. Um, and I think that's great, and, and as much of that as can continue should. Anything beyond that, um, you get into all, type, all types of, like you said, landmine situations with funders and, and uh, uh, sticky conflicts of interest that you might want to avoid. You hear their health coverage is all underwritten by Kaiser Health or something. I don't know. And, and Kaiser Health does actually have a, uh, its own news reporting arm um, that, as far as I can tell, is decently reputable. Um, I, I've never heard any sort of sense of a hidden hand or any type of influence, um, but but it is something that you've got to be completely vigilant about all the time if you if you are going to put news out to the world and expect people to trust it. Um, so I think it's a great question. So I guess it's easy to see why you went into print journalism coming from an English background, but since you were there during the height of you know the decline basically, and that was where you were hitting stride, did you ever contemplate going to more visual medium of, you know, storytelling, investigating, or did you say, I'm going to be on newspapers and that's it? So the layoffs happened in, um, at my paper at the Palm Beach Post in August 2008. I printed out uh, the, whatever, 12 or 16 page application to become a Charleston Police Department officer <laughs> <laughs> the next day, and I carried it around with me for a while. I successfully applied to be a death penalty mitigation investigator in the state of South Carolina and they never called me back <laughs> so while I was a reporter so yeah no I definitely thought about it but you know I, I was like 24 25 people that age should not be allowed to do anything <laughs> like serious that's 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 I have suddenly come to this realization so thank God they never responded to me <laughs> and, I, and I got where I needed to be all the way in the back I'm sorry Oh man, just one. Um, yeah, no. So uh, besides prepare me. For, besides yeah. that, <laughs> that did. I think I do think everybody should go to jail. Um, <laughs> really changes the way you see the world. Jeez, um, that's a great question. I couldn't. I couldn't narrow it down to just one. I mean, the experience of working at the Gamecock for me was transformative. It, it took it from. Uh, I took my interest in, in the profession, it's not really a profession, in the, in the craft, I guess, from sort of a passing thing into a more fully formed, hey, you can actually do this type thing. The Gamecock was, was I can't understate, or I can't overstate the importance of the Gamecock in, in, in what led me to where I am in it right now. We went out and covered Katrina not long after I was arrested. Um, uh, as one of the one of two college papers in the country who did that, we sent two teams: one out to Baton Rouge and in, into the Metairie, right at the edge of of uh, New Orleans, and another into the devastated parts of Mississippi. And we got great stuff. We put out a special section. We pulled out the stops. I was the editor at the time, so we spent a bunch of money for full color, and uh, it was great. Like, where else can you do that when you're in college? <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, and, and I and I don't mean to um, to leave out uh, radio 
in a talk like this. I mean, I've heard some great investigative pieces come out of NPR and uh, PRI and uh, American Public Media in the last couple years. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't see anything happening, um, really, because if I did, then I would be like buying stock in it. <laughs> I, uh, I just I'm, I know that that journalism is not going to go away, and I, I so on the on the um, on the TV reporter front, like it, it's definitely more rare I think to see substantive investigative work coming out of a, a TV station. But it isn't by any means unheard of, and I know a lot of damn good reporters who are TV people who have my utmost respect. Um, I don't think I answered your question at all. I don't even. <laughs> I don't even know. Okay. Well, I, sorry. <laughs> Do you ever get so sorry. attached to a story that's hard to walk away from it when you know it's not working out? Oh, yeah. No, I don't do that. I never, <laughs> I never do that. So I haven't had a story idea fall through since um, 2009. Um, but that's because of like a specific, I take a very like brutal and specific worldview when it comes to stories that I'm going to do and that I'm not going to do and they have to satisfy a lot of different criteria um, which I'm happy to email you if you want <laughs> if you want me to tell you about them later but I don't want to like get into the nitty-gritty um, here but no I, I've got there, there something's got to be wrong when I'm doing a story and it's got to be demonstrably wrong and it has to be acknowledged as wrong by somebody right and then it has to be part of probably, it probably has to be a part of a larger pattern of other things that are wrong like it. Uh, most of the stories that I do follow that kind of a path. And if you do that, if you start with something, I used to call this, I used to say homicide detectives don't um, investigate murder, right? They investigate the, the killing of this person on this date and time. Um, but I stopped saying that because people have started using it against me in different ways. Um, it, it, as reporters, not as like homicide prosecutors. Um, <clears throat> so anyhow, if you start with something that is actually a problem and you work your way out from it, circling around it like a homicide detective would, then your story idea will never fail because at minimum you have something that's wrong to begin with. You don't have this like idea that something's wrong. So that's been my trick for the last seven years. I read a summary of your um, story about the education system in, in Florida. Um, as a K-12 educator myself, I want to say that if you help one student get a better education, because kids don't get to pick out their parents, then your work has been justly rewarded. I appreciate and, that. And just what, what, are the, what has happened since the story? Okay, so, so I completely left out um, from this talk uh, mention, yeah, mention of a series that I did with my wife. Um, that picture of her, wherever she was, uh, is, is a picture of her reporting on a story um, uh, about resegregation in uh, Pinellas County schools. And it, what essentially happened, to make a long story short, is uh, she came to me one day, we were eating lunch, um, and uh, she said, you know, this is weird. Black kids in Pinellas County are doing worse on standardized tests than black kids in any other county that I've ever seen. And by this point, um, she had been a reporter for 12 or 13 years, had worked in five different Florida counties, including some places with really serious poverty and really serious crime. And the county that we were in at the moment, Pinellas, it had nothing like that. So what the hell was going on? Uh, that was sort of the question. That was the beginning point for us. We knew something was wrong, and we had to work our way out from it. Um, so uh, we ended up doing a series of stories. It was the craziest, most intense experience that I've ever had in my life. If any of you are considering um, doing a high wire act investigative reporting venture with your spouse, um, <laughs> you, you, should, you should think very hard about it. <laughs> and I remember. Pulitzers come and go, but divorce is forever. Um, we're, we, we're still together. It's fine. It's fine. But we found that uh, we found we traced the decision back to um, a school board vote in 2007 that resegregated the school district de, de facto. They knew it was going to happen. They were warned. They did it anyway. We found that violent incidents in the five schools 
uh, were on such a rise that those five schools in, uh, first of all, let me back up, there were five elementary schools clustered within six square miles in the black neighborhoods of St. Petersburg, and they were the five worst elementary schools in Florida, essentially. Uh, they were all among the 15 worst in Florida, uh, as ranked by the kids' ability to read on grade level. Um, we found that the, the violence in those schools were, uh, <coughs> there were, there were more violent incidents per year in those schools than in all 17 of the county's high schools combined. Uh, because they had, at the school district level, been neglecting programs that were supposed to make schools safer. We found that teacher turnover was completely rampant at these schools. Um, half the teachers would quit in a given year, and they would replace them with brand new teachers or teachers with, who had problems in other schools and were sort of just passed down into these schools because they figured nobody would make a fuss. Uh, we found that the, the black kids in these schools were getting disciplined uh, uh, targeted for more harsh discipline uh, than white kids were, or kids of any other race. Um, they were four times as likely to get suspended out of school, if I recall, uh, for minor offenses things and, and vague offenses, things like defiance or disobedience, that kind of thing. And we found that the school district uh, transportation policies were um, rigged in a way that discriminated against black families in that the best schools in the county were basically off limits to the black families who didn't have the means or the ability to get their kids to and from school themselves. Um, since then, they have done a ton of stuff. Um, thank you for asking about it. They, they have hired uh, an individual and put him in charge of turning around these five schools. They're paying him $100,000. They're serious about it. He has hired a team. Since then, they have brought up um, paying the teachers in these schools uh, bonuses of as much as $25,000 a piece, which is something that they completely balked at before. Uh, they're adding staff, they're doing more training, they're doing all the stuff that we basically highlighted in the stories, uh, while giving us like the barest amount of credit that they possibly can. That's how it works. That was way long, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I have been threatened um, with a lawsuit once um, by the son of the medical examiner who did the autopsy on Anna Nicole Smith when she died at the Hard Rock Cafe. It was just a coincidence, but he was like a kind of a, a lousy doctor and he had, botched, uh, he had botched some medical procedure to the point where he got disciplined back in the day. And so he had to find work as a pill mill, um, a pain clinic prescriber. He was working at a, 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 a doctor's office that was owned and operated by a, a, cocaine, a cocaine cowboy from the 80s heyday down in Florida. He had a false leg, and, um, <laughs> and he had been arrested like 66 times. It was incredible. <laughs> and um, so he, uh, he was prescribing pills for this guy, and I wrote a story about him. And um, he, he had a problem with the way that I characterized his practice at this guy's office, um, but before he could sue me, he uh, instead was arrested by the uh, DEA, so it was fine. <laughs> that was it. What's, what's your team like, and where do you find people who are interested in doing the same kind of things you do? Dean, they're, they're insufferable. <laughs> what's, what's the newspaper's commitment to investigate this one? Yeah. No, I, I, I was just kidding. My team is great. We've got um, 11 people uh, who, who work under me. Uh, one editor um, who is uh, the most like talented and versatile uh, newspaper person I've ever met uh, in my entire life. He used to be an investigative reporter at Newsday. And um, he also was a specialist in computer programming and in bringing to life some of the things that um, those of you who checked out our school series might have seen with the graphics. Uh, so we have a whole contingent working under him uh, who are dedicated to that type of data and visualization type reporting. Um, aside from that, we have one full-time investigative reporter and a couple of sort of hybrid data um, investigative reporters. But these are people who know how to, uh, at a minimum, use Excel and Access uh, fluently to manipulate big data, or well, big-ish data, and uh, 
and, and most of them know how to write Python code um, to do things like design our stories or to design graphics in our stories or to do high-level analysis with millions of records that is otherwise uh, unavailable to us. So it's just, it's tremendous. It's, it's incredible. I've never seen a, a team at a newspaper um, with, with this type of range uh, as the one that I work for. And as for the paper's commitment to it, um, you know, it hadn't been a secret. It's been reported that our paper is, is laying people off right now. And uh, the, the editor, before this, before this came up, he took me aside and he looked me dead in the eye and he said, I want you to know that this is not going to affect you. This is not going to change what you do or what we do. And we've got your back 100%. I've, I've never seen a commitment to investigative reporting uh, like the one at the Tampa Bay Times. So I'm honored and proud to work for him. Yeah, that's that's funny. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's the, back when. I, so I think it's worse, honestly, when you're a, when you're like a crime reporter. Um, there, there were there were there was stuff that uh, that I covered when I was a crime reporter that had a lasting effect on me. That I true like I have come to terms with the fact that that has actually sort of changed the way that I act on a given day and time. As an investigative reporter. There isn't, people, people ask this question a lot. It's like, well, you know, how are you going to, how invested do you get and how, how do you come home at the end of the day and become emotionally detached from it or whatnot? And it's just like, you know, we don't want to, so I think that if you approach investigative reporting like that, you are, in, you are bound to hit some trouble sooner or later and probably some like story trouble, some like big problem execution trouble. Uh, and the reason for that is wh when you're going out and doing investigative reporting, in my opinion, you shouldn't be like, we're going to nail these scumbags. Mm -hmm. You should be like, um, okay, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. I just want to know. Y it's almost like, it is it's almost like a homicide detective getting up. And it's like he never wants to get up and solve the murder, right? Because it's more work. But you got to do it. So you're obligated to do it. I feel almost like investigative reporters should approach their subjects like that. And, and keep this sort of investment or emotional attachment to a minimum because it just creates problems and, it, and it'll just screw up your story in the way that you tell it, I think. It'll make it less real or credible for the people who don't have that same attachment. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.